You're tuned in to Girl Stop Playing, and I'm your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know I'm bringing you the information and the conversations to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. Before we get into today's episode, please make sure that you like this video, comment below and let us something let us know something that you are taking away from our conversation and be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss out on any more bomb episodes we got dr eva in the studio hey. welcome to the show thank you for having me okay so you got to give yourself a proper <laughs> introduction so look into that camera and tell the people who you are all right so i'm dr eva spelled eva but i say eva <laughs> I was like, wait, <laughs> but it's, it's, but it's, it look like Eva, but it's Ava. Okay, it's we got fine. it. We a lot got of people it. say Eva, um, but I say Dr. Ava. I grew up in Haiti until about the age of 15. I moved to the U.S., but that's a different story on another podcast because <laughs> that story is insane. But um, I went to medical school in the U.K. and then moved to the U.S., transferred to Ross University, and did my residency in internal medicine in Macon, Georgia. Wow. Hence okay. the reason why I'm here in Atlanta. Yes. I'm uh, married and I have three kids, a step stepdaughter and two boys. Got you. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> let's get into the crazy story. Because I'm always intrigued at I'm I'm always intrigued by people who are not what I call basic black, which is what I consider myself, because I my family's from like Alabama, right? We don't have like international roots. I don't know my lineage, and so I'm very much so intrigued with people who do. So tell me how you ended up coming to, in the U.S.? Yeah, coming to the U.S. Okay, so being from Haiti and having both of my parents, Haitian, born there, you know, I grew up there, went to school there and all that, the the political situation in Haiti has been really unstable for many years. Mm -hmm. Kind of worse now, but it's ups and down. So as a young child, my mom decided after she got divorced from my dad when I was about six, seven, that she wanted to move here. Okay. So she got us the residency paperwork. But we were still living in Haiti, so we were going back and forth to get the stamp and the passport. Because okay. when you are a U.S. resident, you're technically supposed to leave in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But we were living in Haiti. So we would fly often. So how did you get the forth. residency? Um, <laughs> I don't know how okay, she did it. Okay, we don't know how she did it. I don't okay, know how okay. she did it, but um, technically you're supposed to be in the U.S. Right. But we were going back and forth. Um, and then one day, things got really bad, and she said, you know what, I'm done, I'm leaving. So she left me and my brother with my grandparents temporarily to come to the U.S. to study for her USMLE, which is the exam you're supposed to take to be able to do residency in the U.S. because she's a doctor in Haiti. Okay. Um, and that was around June, July. So December came around, Christmas time, and we wanted to see her. She got us a plane ticket. My brother and I flew here for the first time alone. We always had her with us. Um, we knew English, but very little English. Like, you learn English through TV, mm -hmm. you learn it in school, but you're not really speaking fluent. it fluent. Right. right. Um, I guess lending here, they figured out that we didn't live here. And he started threatening us to, to send us back to Haiti. I was Who? crying. Immigration. Oh, immigration. Okay. Yeah. I was crying. My brother was begging, saying, my mom's here. She's waiting. Please, please, please. He was like, fine. Put something in the passport pretty much having us stay here by force and not be able to go back for three years or all the paperwork would be taken away. And so, you know, when you travel from Haiti to the U.S., at least back then, you would bring, like, empty luggages, shop, shop, bring everything back, whether it's shoes, clothes, toys, books, toothpaste, soap, whatever you need. Um, so we came with really nothing. Because y'all were going to get everything here Because we were going to get everything back. here, shop, it's Christmas time, and then go back. Um, and we ended up having to stay. We were stuck. My mom had a one-bedroom apartment. It was just the three of us, so we had to go register to go to school. It was just like Abrupt, unexpected. Just unexpected. Just, yeah, happened just like that. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So okay, so, you, so she's here. in Florida? She's now in Florida. Okay. Mm -hmm. Still, to this day, she's in Florida? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you get to Miami, and you're like, okay, this is home now. Was this that, like, home. culture shock? What was the hardest transition? Because you're 15? Almost 15. 15. A couple months away from being 15. So you were already in high school? So that was the hardest transition, was going to school here, which was totally different from the school system in Haiti. Uh -huh. Like, that was a shocker. So they put me in the ninth grade, 
when I got to the ninth grade, that first week, realizing that, well, well, the school that I was into that I got accepted to was a magnet school. So okay. it was half French, half English. Because you were fluently French. Right. So three of my classes were in French and three of my classes were in English. Okay. Um, I think my math class was in French and I had French class and then another class in French. I don't, rem- I don't remember which one. Um, really the shocker was the first week I got here realizing that half of the things they were teaching me I had already done in Haiti. So that first week I was in ninth grade. They put me in the 10th grade. Okay. So I finished 10th grade, skipped 11 and went straight to 12. What kind of uh, accelerated track was that? Or you had already covered. So did you test out? Is that basically what happened? Yeah, because the system here was way easier than what we were used to. So it was a breeze. It was like, ugh, this is too easy. I already know this. I did this in fifth grade. Yeah, it was so easy. But college was not, though. Okay. That was a steep, steep, steep change. So I want to talk about that because you said you went in the U.K. and here. Mm -hmm. How did that end up happening? So I ended up doing my undergrad in Boca in Florida which was about an hour and a half north from Miami. Okay. And then from there, I went straight to the UK when I graduated my undergrad to do my first two years of medical school there. Why? What made you want to do that? So, see, I feel like it's a couple things. One, because I'm from Haiti, I'm going somewhere else is not like a big deal. It's not something that crossed my mind. I didn't have to think about it twice. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is the people that I had around me. They are, your parents always tell you that who you have around you can make you or break you, yep. and that's true. Mm-hmm. I'm now realizing that. But back then, um, it was the crew that I met, the people that I was around. It was some folks that wanted to go to medical school, dental school, and so they were so focused and wanting to like be that mm-hmm. that it kind of encouraged me to be like to them. To do it too. And so we stuck together and just helped each other out. And a few of them really wanted to go to the UK, and I was like, okay, I'll go too. So got you. That's how so it good happened. influences is what hey, got right, you over there. Right. So how long were you in the UK? Two years. Two years. Yeah. Finished what you were supposed to do there and then came back? Or Didn't you... really like the UK much. Okay. Um, it's a beautiful place, but the weather sucks. I heard it's, it's it it cold like, and rainy. It's cold and rainy all the time. They may have a couple of good months in the summer, sunny but I just hated it. I mean, going from Haiti from to Haiti Miami. From Haiti to Miami, yeah, And yeah. then Miami to Boca, which is pretty much the same weather. Mm-hmm. And then, boom, you're in the UK. Yeah, like, yeah, Like, yeah. what is this? You Were know? there, I'm surprised at the black culture just all around the world. What was the black culture like in the UK? I feel like it's very different from what it is in the US and also very different from what it is in Haiti and also different from what it is when I go to Africa. Right. You know? Um, it's hard to explain. It's just black people are black people. You know, we all root for each other, of course. We have a lot of the same roots. Um, but at the same time, the culture is mm-hmm, different. Mm-hmm, the way mm-hmm. you do things is different. Your way of thinking might be different. So, <sighs> what was dating like? Because you were college, well, post college. Were you like early 20s? early 20s yeah mm-hmm. was it a big difference dating there, in the uk yeah no not really no no hmm. i just i didn't really do much dating um you know medical school is so much studying that you don't really have you a lot have time of time for all that. to like right so if you're dating you're dating amongst yourselves and somebody else who's in medical school right with you probably. amongst yourselves you yeah. don't really go out, you don't really have the time to go out and meet people outside got you of that so at what point did you meet your husband so um, when I decided to leave the UK and come back to the US, I transferred into Ross University, which that school is in the Caribbean. At okay. the time, it used to be in Dominica. I think now it's in Barbados, but at the time it was in Dominica. And it's a really good school. Like That school in St. George's have really good reputations. And they told me that the only way they would accept me is if I passed the USMLE. So I came back, moved in with my mom, studied for three months, had no car, no phone, nothing, just studied. My, my head was in the books all day long. Took the test, did well, they accepted me, and then I studied my clinical rotation. So I've never been to the island because what they do is they have the first two years on the island and then the last two years in the U.S., okay. more different states, and you're doing your clinical rotation. So one of my clinical rotations was OBGYN in Atlanta, and I just happened to be around one of the doctors, Dr. Tucker, was teaching us, and mm-hmm. my husband now at the time was supposed to open up a business with him, and he walked in, and that's how we met. 
Was he a doctor? He was a doctor at the time. Okay. He's 10 years older than me, so he was already done, established, all that. We met briefly and then reconnected a couple of years later when I started residency in Macon because he was working in Macon as well. Wow, okay. So he lived in Atlanta but was driving down to Macon and then we connected that way. And and the yeah, rest is history. And we're here now. So <laughs> 10 years your senior. 11. 11 years. Yes. Do you, f was that an issue at first? Were you interested in it? Was it like, okay, wait a minute. Did you feel any type of way about that? Or I did not. No, okay. At the time, I did not. Have you felt any effects? How long have y'all been married? 12 years. 12 years. Okay, so have you felt any effects of that? No. No? No. No. Really? No. That is great. Yeah. Yeah, no. I, I have not. And the crazy thing is my best friend's, my he, my best friend's husband is also 11 years older than her. Okay. Or 11 years. Okay. Um, But I think with my husband, like, he's so young. He's young at heart, so at you're heart, not. Yeah, so I'm not really feeling the difference. It's not like. He's treating me like he's 10 years older than gotcha. me. Gotcha. And he's not I mean? acting like he's 10 years yeah, older. He's like, just, yeah. Right, like he's my dad or something. Right, no. right, 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 right. Got yeah. you. Okay, so you have three children. One is a bonus baby. One is a bonus baby. What are the ages? So she's 15 now. Okay. And then the boys are almost 12 and almost um 10. Okay, so, so two years apart. Two years okay, apart. Okay, that's, that's like my babies. Yeah. So you got to give me, like, the warning. You have two boys? I have two boys. Oh, a two-year-old and a four-month-old. Wow, yeah, okay. So it's hard at first. Yes, it is. Because they're so close in age, so you still have them both in diapers. When does it balance out? Oh, child. Boys have a lot of energy. Boys have a lot of energy, okay? And boys love their mom. So they're going to be, like, tied to you 24-7. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, it would be to the point where, like, me and my husband are sitting down, and they bypass him completely to come yeah, to like me. Yeah, like he's not there. And he's like, you don't see me? Oh, hi, daddy. You know? <laughs> yep, that's how it um, is. But my firstborn, Eli, did not sleep at all. Like, he woke up every two hours. Maybe by the time he was four and a half, five, every three hours. Girl, why? This kid woke up two times or three times a night to come down to my room. How did you survive that? To the point For where like, I was so scared to have another baby because I thought this was normal. I was like, is that how it's gonna be if I have another child? And then I brought Eden home and right away he slept five to six hours. So that was really a good help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like two boys, back to back, they're gonna be best friends. They're gonna be able to do everything together. That's what you I'm can looking take them to, to school together, parties together, do everything together. It's hard at first, but it gets easier. I've heard, like I've been reading all of the things and just talking to moms with multiple kids and they, what I've read, please don't burst my bubble if this is not true. But what I've heard is that by like six, seven months, like when the youngest one is six or seven months, you start to feel like a normal human being again. Cause right now it's just like, they're so different. You know, the two year old is talking my head off, telling me what he want, bossing me around. And the four month old is just like, he just there. Yeah, he needs you. He just, he's just there. Yeah. So I'm like, he's not even obviously sitting up on his own yet. You know, all of those things. So I'm waiting for it to like, okay. Whew. I feel like a normal person. I think again. it's way more than six months. Oh, you burst my bubble. Okay. I think it's, it's not like six years, six though, is it? It's not like six years. No, right? it's not like six years, but I feel like because they're so close in age, you know, it's going to take a minute for you to be able to be like, oh, who's that? And then I'm trying to have another one. Are you done? I'm done. Done, done. Yeah, I'm done. I wanted another one. He was done, done. But now with the gap, like, Eden's almost 10. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, it. Like, yeah. I'm not going to bring another child in the yeah, world right now. Yeah, people who reset that clock, I'm like, girl, stop yeah, playing. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, But just be imagine. ready to have, like, holes in the wall. I'm not ready you know, for that. like, things broken all the time. I had a handyman on speed, speed dial. Every six months, I would call him and be like, okay, fix this, fix that, fix this, fix that. Did you ever feel like you needed to take a parenting class? Were your kids mm -hmm. ever misbehaving? Yeah. What do you do about it? I don't know. You haven't figured it out either? No. Okay. I'm still trying to figure it out. I think there's no book on parenting. It's just hard. You just have it to just learn it. It just seems like, but when your kids are doing stuff, it feels like your kids are the only one that does this crazy stuff. Like, yeah. surely nobody else's That's, kids are doing right. that. <laughs> and they are, though. We all feel the same way. But we all, it's not like that. That's how we think. But it's not like that. Everybody is, like, struggling. Parenting is hard. 
especially when you're working mom that part because you easy. are very much so still a doctor yes and i work full time and you work full time and what, i always have what does your day look like my day now is different from what it used to be so being married to another doctor was a challenge. Is like, he still practicing too? Yes. Okay. The beginning of our relationship, the beginning of our marriage was so hard because he's full-time working in the ER. I'm full-time working in the hospital and they're giving us our schedule. So there will be time where like, I don't see him for a couple of days mm. because I'm working overnight or he's working, you know, we're bypassing Are you at the same each other. Hospital? No, okay. we're not at the same hospital. Um, and then you have young kids and we don't have family in town and daycare doesn't open on the weekends so it was really really challenging with eli i was lucky enough to find someone to come to the house so she stayed at the house with us during mm -hmm. the day until i came home so eli did not start daycare until 12 months okay but then he also got sick a lot because his body wasn't used to it mm. whereas eden started daycare at six weeks okay because i had to go back to work mm -hmm. you know six weeks um how did that affect his immune system he was strong like a bull and he yeah. still is strong yeah. like a bull like yeah. he barely gets sick you know, I guess as a baby. Because he, he got, got it out sick. of his system earlier. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because when Eli was 12 months, that's when they're crawling, touching things, everything, putting things put everything in, in their, their mouth, mouth yep. touching other kids, and he was always sick. How always is sick. that now? Is he sick, not sick? Like, does he get sick more than the youngest? I'm trying to yeah, figure yeah, out my Yeah, yeah, he life. always got sick more okay. than the youngest. Okay. Still till this day. Okay. He doesn't get sick often, but he gets sick more, more. than the other when you compare the two. Gotcha. For sure. Okay. Yeah, always have. Um, my life is a lot better now in part because my husband quit the hospital okay. and opened up his own practice so he makes his schedule now so now he makes his schedule okay. works no weekends rarely has to do a saturday no nights no holidays none of that which helps mm -hmm. because i have to work every other weekend got you okay. and if it's a holiday i still have to work if it happens to be every your, other weekend your, right right so he stays at home with the kids if i have to do a, like late night he stays at home with the kids because his schedule is much better. That I think is what really saved our relationship. Really? And a lot yes. It was hard. People was don't ever talk honestly about the impact that parenting has on a relationship. Just the the craziness that you feel like an insane person going into this new transition. Um, and then you're trying to figure out each other. And then there's uncontrollable circumstances, right? You can't yes. control your schedule. He can't control his schedule, but right. y'all have this baby and y'all are trying to figure it out. What do you think was like the the biggest lesson that parenting has taught you in terms of like your partnership? Really to, as a mother, okay? Cause our minds is always going 24 seven. Even if you're not at work, you're at home, your mind is always going 24 seven you're always putting yourself last. Mm -hmm. It's always the kids, the house, the pets, the this, the that, and then you put yourself last. I wish I knew then what I know now, because the things that I'm doing now and the things that I'm willing to not compromise on now, I wish I knew, I wish I knew that in my 20s, Girl, actually. tell me, help In me my out. 20s. So just growing up as a woman and not really knowing yourself. A lot of us don't really know ourselves. We just go with the flow. You don't really take the time to sit down and talk to yourself. Like, what do you want? What's not okay with you? What is a boundary that you're not gonna let other people cross? Mm -hmm. You know, like things like that you don't really think about. So you don't really get to know yourself. So you put yourself in situations that sometimes you look back and you're like, why, why did I do that? Why did I even let this happen? Why did I settle for that? Yeah, like, why, why yeah. like, how did I end up here? You know, but the older you get and the wiser you are, the more you think about it. Um, but there are things now, even in my relationship and even with the kids that I've had to change. And at first changing those things made me look evil. Like you're going to do that. How can you or do that? Make you feel How bad. Can, yeah. Mom guilt is yeah, a real thing, It is. but you have to realize that you're doing it for yourself. And then over time it becomes a new normal mm -hmm. in the household, for example, when I decided to go to the gym and do that for me, no matter what, I was gonna go three days a week, no matter what, nothing was gonna make me not go to the gym. 
the kids would make me feel so guilty. You're leaving again, you always going to the gym. You don't like us, you're always leaving us. Like, they would say things like that or even cry, make me feel really bad driving to the gym. Like, how can I do that? How can I do that? But now, bye mommy, we'll mm -hmm, see you later, mm -hmm, you know? And they, <laughs> see, like, they see the value, or they when they start seeing the results or when they start seeing that you were dedicated to mm -hmm, yourself, mm -hmm. I think in the long run, you know, it's it's gonna be a positive thing, but yeah. damn it, that mom guilt yeah, is does. really real. It's bad. It is. It's bad. So that doesn't go away either? It goes away slowly, but you okay. have to be really conscious of that because it can eat you alive. I think <laughs> what I'm realizing, like even like just in this season that I'm in with still being a new mom, right? I barely got out of postpartum before getting pregnant again. I don't even know if technically I was out of postpartum, but people pleasing is a real thing. And I think we talk about people pleasing, you know, as single women, we talk about people pleasing, we talk about just the negatives of people pleasing, but we don't realize that we bring that a lot of times into our marriage and into motherhood. And we think though that I'm not gonna be a people pleaser to the outside world, but it's okay if I'm a people pleaser to my husband. Right. And you're, that's still not okay, but no. it's uncomfortable even thinking that thought, yeah. like that I'm supposed to put my needs above my husband or my kids, but if you don't, life is gonna, like it's, you're it, going to be forced to do right. it. Right, it takes a toll on you at mm -hmm. some point. It's coming, mm -hmm. it's gonna come sooner or later. I mean, you can only do this for so long. Right. Eventually, the whole system crashes. So are you seeing this, what type of, of medicine, because it's like general. I do internal medicine, okay. but I do hospital medicine. So, okay, explain that. Like, I just see adult patients in the hospital setting, so, so is really that, but people. that's not like ER though. No, so no. Who, so people just come to the hospital. To so people come to the emergency room. They get seen by the ER doctor uh -huh. for minor things, major things. If they need to stay in the hospital and be admitted oh, for whatever okay. reason, if they okay. have heart failure, kidney failure, pneumonia, whatever it is, they need surgery. Then they call me. Gotcha. I go down there. I admit them up to the hospital, and then I continue to see them and care for them upstairs. So you are caring for just a whole host of things. There's not like one thing. That seems like a lot of pressure. Is it's that a lot, lot of pressure? Of, it is. It's a lot of stress because they're not people that are just walking into a clinic. You give them something and they leave. They're sick, you know, and it's like really sick stuff. Cancer. And it's like your or, responsibility to help yes, them through this. Yes. Yeah. It's so a lot. What's your self-care like? Like I said, I wish I knew what I know now then because the stuff that I'm doing now has... I feel like it saved me physically, mentally, and it saved me, it saved my marriage for sure, our relationship, and me being the mom that I am now, you know, taking care of myself. So I go to the gym five days a week. Oh, no you compromise. went from three to five. She I said, went from three girl. To five. I went from three to four to five. <laughs> <sighs> what are you so, doing at the gym? Like weights and stuff? I have a trainer I because I don't think so I would be able to do it on my own. So I have a trainer. Okay. Coach, trainer. Um, and we're there an hour and a half, five days a week. So that's something that I'm doing for me. You went today? I went today. I went this morning, okay? <sighs> so serious. my phone is just on do not disturb. It's just my me time to focus on me, and that has really helped me a, a lot. Um, I take break away from home. Like Mother's Day, I took a solo trip. Ooh. International. I love that. Yeah, that was liberating. That's what we should all do on. Um, Mothers, <laughs> let's unite and just go on, go away. That's, go a, away. that's what we really want yeah. for Mother's Day, to get I away from these I had the best kids. sleep ever in my hotel room. Yes. Nobody hotel coming sleep. in my room to wake me mm -hmm. up. You know, went to the spa every day, walked on the beach whenever I felt like it. Like I love that. So just like stepping away from your everyday life mm -hmm. is also a must. Of course, mommy guilt is gonna kick in in full force, but you just push through and you come back better than before. Mm -hmm. So like always listening to what your body and what your mind and your soul needs and not ignoring that, because we've been ignoring that for too long as black women, because yep. we're just thought to just push through and just put everything on our shoulders and put ourselves last, Yep, you know? And I think this new generation is changing that. For sure. We yeah. are the generation that, like, cares about mental health. Mm -hmm. And we, we're, we're gentle parenting. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be intentional. Mm -hmm. We're politically correct. We're not repeating what our parents, what our parents did. Right. And, and the positive side of that is, like, our kids are definitely going to reap the benefits. But the negative side of that is it is hard 
trying to be the best version of you, like truly just trying to be the best. Yeah the best mom, the best in your career, the best version of yourself, it's so much easier to just be like, forget it, y'all gonna get what y'all get. And that's what I feel like our parents was doing. Like, <sighs> y'all gonna get what y'all get, sit down, be quiet, shut up, don't ask no questions. I wish I could be just like not caring so much about what I'm producing yeah, here. Yeah, it's, it's tough. We don't have the luxury of being able to do that. Yeah, it's tough. It's not easy, for sure. What do you but. feel like you're going to teach your sons about dating? And obviously, it's Ooh, a little early. It's a little soon. It's a little <laughs> soon. But we always have these conversations, or at least I have these conversations with mom, um, girl moms, about like whether they're teaching their daughters. Because we always hear like women aren't raised to be wives. We're not, mm -hmm. you know, we're not sending our children off into the world with these skills, these relationship readiness skills. But I don't usually talk to boy moms about this. So I want to ask you, have you thought about that yet? Has the conversation come up with your husband? Like, what are your thoughts just around, like, what your what your message will be to your Definitely sons? Definitely have not talked to my husband about that. <laughs> Whether it's for my daughter or the boys, we have not had that conversation. Not for the daughter either? No, because I feel what, like... She's, I know. <laughs> girl, it is time, girl. I feel like as parents, you dread it. Yeah. You don't want to see that. No. You know, you want your kids to be kids. You to want be your babies. kids to be babies and still stay little. But I think with her being 15, it's more so the men that would teach the women how to be treated. I feel like the father is the it's one that showing should, her. Yes. Yeah. So, so... In the way he acts with me, in the way right. he interacts in the household, in the way he does things around the house, I think she'll see those things mm -hmm. and want those things in another man. You right. know, like as women, you kind of want to emulate what your, your father, father mm -hmm. yeah. And I feel it's the opposite for the sons. Right. So it's They're probably looking at you. gonna be, yeah, it's probably gonna be me that needs to teach them how how a woman should be treated. Yep. Um, so yeah, I mean, I tell them to open the door for mommy, open the door for other women in public, you know, little things like that. But I haven't really thought about them dating yet. Girl, it's coming, girl. I know. So I had a girl mom <laughs> who said that one of her house rules is like her daughter has to date before she goes off to college. Like she is intentional about wanting her daughter to experience the highs, the lows, the heartbreaks, the, all of the things with her there to be able to support her through it. And I tell everybody that I can, because I'm like, I just think that this is just so genius that you're being that intentional about being an active participant in your daughter's dating yeah. life. Which I, and I want to ask, like, what is, culturally, how is this handled in Haiti? I don't think you can avoid it. You can't. I mean, as a parent, you can pretend it's exactly. not happening and pretend I don't want to see it. No, you're not going to date. They're still going to do it. They're still doing it. They're it's just whether or not it. they feel comfortable talking to you about exactly. it. Exactly. So... You know, like I said, our generation are doing things different from back then. My grandma would probably say, no, no dating until you go to college. Don't bring no But I'm in still going to date. Exactly. You know, I'm going to do it behind your back. Yep. So um, right now, if it happens, I'm just going to let it happen and go with the flow. She wants to, she wants to. If she doesn't, she doesn't. Whatever she wants to do. Um, but it's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. it's you know, happening. high school kids, I mean, they start early. <laughs> Girl, high school. They're dating. Early. Middle school, elementary. I mean, Middle it is... school, yeah. My son is already talking about, can I have a girlfriend? I'm like, no, not yet. You're only in sixth grade. <laughs> that part. But it's coming. It's coming. So what is the message, I guess, in Haiti for young girls? Because culturally, oh, in America, yes. young white women, young white girls and young black girls are, are taught two totally different things. What are young Haitian girls taught in terms of dating, relationship, marriage, or is it even a conversation? It is a conversation. Um, in Haiti, just like in the African world, you know, the girls are supposed to behave a certain way and not do certain things and do certain things. You're supposed to know how to cook and do the dishes and wash the laundry and you know take care of a household, things like that. That's expected of a girl. So are you taught that? Like is your grandma, your mom, are, are you, is that just the expectation or are they actively like showing you these Both. things? Both, okay. it's the expectation and they're and actively they're showing, showing that. So you growing up, seeing your mom and your grandparents and the women do all the work in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, the women are doing all the work, the work inside of the house. So it's expected. Okay. So as you're growing up, 
they're asking you to come in here and help cook and help do all those things. Gotcha. Whereas here, I feel like it's everybody's responsibility in the household. You know, it's not the same. So if you're growing up in a household in Haiti or even in Africa, because it's very similar, um, the men don't cook. They don't do dishes, don't do laundry. So who cooks in your house? My husband don't cook. But you you at work. Yeah, you gotta cook food. before you leave. Oh, okay, he'll okay, buy food okay, okay, or he'll okay. get somebody to cook for him if okay. I'm not around. Okay. You know, um, but generally speaking, if it's you're your growing up in Haiti, it's somebody else cooking for the men. So they come home, there's a meal already prepared for them. You know, whether it's the wife doing it, their mother, mother-in-law, or if they have a maid, gotcha. somebody's doing it for them. They not doing it. They're not in the kitchen. Okay. They don't even know how to cook. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas here, the mentality is we're both in this house together we're both gonna raise the kids together we're both gonna cook together and we're both gonna do things in the household together we're gonna buy the groceries i'm gonna go sometimes you're gonna go sometimes i'm gonna do something with the kids sometimes you're gonna do it sometimes so it's more of a sharing the responsibility responsibility. the woman always does more regardless of no matter where you are in the in the world (laughs) in the world it's always more in the woman but um it's a different mentality where it's not expected right. of the woman to have to cook a meal every single day. So did your husband grow up in Africa? When he was seven, he moved here. To, yeah. So what is his, I guess, cultural expectation or does he have one? Like, is he more on the American side where it's like somebody's going to figure it out, we'll figure it out together? Or is he, does he have like a set expectation for you as his wife? I think it started out with him having an expectation. <laughs> you like, girl, he <laughs> left that expectation. He let that go. Okay. Then realize, uh, no, it's not happening because I'm a whole doctor like you and I got to work full time like you. So we have the same amount of hours in the day. Okay. We, as we the do, same yeah. amount of hours you got is what I got. <laughs> so he quickly had to realize these expectations had to go out the window because I wasn't gonna be the wife to be home every day cooking. You married a doctor. When so. I gotta go to work yeah. too. You know, like if I'm paying bills like you and I got work like you, we're gonna share the responsibility together. Was so, that tough? It was. It was. Did you have that conversation before you got married? No. It was no. okay, 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 okay. <laughs> it's not like we sat down and had those specific conversations. Like sometimes when you get married and after you have kids even Things happen that you never thought can't prepare about. For or talk yeah. About. yeah, it's not things that you knew would pop up. So you can never sit down and talk about every single thing. Right. You know what I mean? You talk about the major stuff, but there's gonna be things that arise mm-hmm, that you're just gonna mm-hmm. have to deal with at the moment. What season do you feel like you're in in your marriage right now? Like, how would you describe or define this season? I feel like we're in a good season now. I feel like the first nine years. Girl, were, not nine years. The first nine years. Like people say seven. <sighs> But the first nine years really took some time to adjust and figure it out. And, and like get in your yes, groove. Yes. And partly because the kids are also growing up and they're a little bit more independent. Mm-hmm. So that helps a lot. Right. You know, so we're able to do things and not really have to worry about the kids as much. But the first nine years took it took it took a minute. It takes a minute because when you think about it, you're your own person. He's his own person, and you're trying to get two different people together, (laughs) you know? And I'm from Haiti, he's from Ghana, so add the cultural differences to that on top of it. And then you add kids. I was gonna say, then throw in them babies. Yeah, and then you had kids, and then you add two stressful careers on That's top a lot. of it. That's a lot. It's a lot. And no family around. I was going to say, not a lot of support system. Nah, the support system really wasn't there, so we were having to figure it out on our own with nannies and daycare and other things like that. So all of that together took a lot of patience, a lot of compromise, a lot of, like, praying. <laughs> <laughs> so advice for a newlywed. <laughs> what would your biggest piece of advice be for a woman who has just gotten married? Respect, I think respect is like the number one thing you can have because you have to be able to respect each other. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how angry I am, I have to watch what I'm gonna say because I have to show respect, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, I think that is the most important thing. (laughs) Is it like a choose your battles type of thing or is is it like a no one to be quiet? 
Because yeah, those are the all lessons of the above. that are like... It's all of the above. It sometimes takes 24 hours. We can talk about it tomorrow. After you know. the dust settles, the yes. smoke clears. Okay. It's sometimes, um, you know what? I'm just going to let him have it. I'm not... It's, it's not, not worth, worth it. it. Yeah. It's um, sometimes knowing what to say and how to say it because you can still relay the same message but the way you say it <laughs> makes a difference mm-hmm. so you can mm-hmm. still express your feelings express um what you want to say and get him to do what you want him to do but it it's all in how you present the problem give us that cheat code how do you get these men to do what you want them to do without beating them down because that that is not going to get you what you want no beating them down is not they're going to do the opposite yeah. So it's again the way you communicate. Mm. You know, it's okay. you gotta do it with respect. That's why I always say respect is key. You have to like the person that you're with and respect the person that, that you're part. with. Once you start liking them and I mean you stop liking them and you stop respecting them, it's gonna go down. So what do you what would you say was your biggest challenge over that nine year time where was there ever a moment where you like, oof? I don't really know if this is gonna work. Did it's you ever marriage. get? <laughs> you're always gonna have those thoughts. And those really? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes you ask yourself, so I ain't "Can been I through do nothing this? Yet. Can I do this, like for real." But the biggest challenge is um, blending families. That's the biggest, biggest challenge. Being a bonus mommy. Yes. Because she was what, like three, two, two. Ooh. So she was like less than two when we met. Okay. But two and a half when we got married. Okay. So she's been around, you know, she's like, she's my child. Yeah. I, that's why I say I have three kids. But dealing with another person, you know, that, that that's the biggest challenge. Yeah. Because they don't know you, they don't understand you, they may not like you. Um, Is it still a challenge 10 years in? Not as much anymore because I have boundaries that now I'm reinforcing that I didn't do before. You didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. And like you said, I was trying to be liked. I was trying to be um, you don't want to ruffle the feathers. You don't want to best mom yeah. and the best everything mm-hmm. bending backwards to do X, Y, Z when half the time they don't take they take it for granted, mm-hmm. you know, and you're breaking your back and, and who's paying the price you right. it's not sustainable. So I have boundaries that I don't cross and that's with anybody him my kids now friends my mother-in-law anybody (laughs) this is like that is very much so like the evolution of ava right because that is to me the goal is to get to that point where regardless of because we look at other people and we're like no they're above you know like your husband I'm not going to, like, my husband is my end-all be-all, so forget what I desire, forget my wants, my needs. I'm not going to ruffle any feathers. His mother, you know, we have, like, the mother-in-law on, like, hey, I know she's watching this, so, hey, I'm not specifically talking about you, (laughs) but other mother-in-laws, they're, like, on this pedestal, and it's like, I'm not going to say anything, I'm not going to step out of line, I'm not going to do, and then 10 years down the line, you're like, well, wait a damn minute. I've been shrinking myself down. I've been living in this box. I've been harboring these emotions or hiding my feelings or sweeping this stuff under the rug and you'll literally like explode right. trying to hold on to all of that or make yourself sick yeah it's coming like i said it's gonna come sooner or later the time is coming so it's better for you to do something about it now because it's not sustainable right you're gonna crash you're gonna hit, right it's you're gonna coming. hit a brick wall yeah you're gonna crash eventually <sighs> If it's not mentally, it's going to be physically Mm -hmm. for sure. So setting up those boundaries was the best thing I could have done for myself. Um, And it hasn't even been that long. I could say maybe three years is when I started to just say, okay, this is what I'm not going to do. This is what I'm not going to take. And they're just going to have to accept it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't accept it, that's on them. But that's my boundary. And then I started going to therapy. I go to therapy every other week, which I think that a lot of us wait until there's a problem to go to therapy, but I feel like it's great to go to therapy when there's no problem Mm -hmm. because it gives you the- To avoid the problems, hopefully. (laughs) And it gives you a way of dealing with things that may arise Mm -hmm. or dealing with things that you're internalizing that you don't even know you're dealing with. Right. So um, having the perspective of a professional, the way they ask you the questions, the way they make you see things yourself. yeah. Yeah, like they're not telling you what to do, but they're making you see things on your own and you're like, wait a minute. I never thought about it that way. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's what I can do. A good therapist, because the wrong therapist 
will send you back to therapy. It could, <laughs> I mean, you know. I've gotten recently, maybe in, what was that? Maybe like January, maybe December, um, I started seeing a life coach. Mm -hmm. I had never saw a life coach before. Different from therapy, mm -hmm. um, but I am really finding it to be helpful. Yeah. I have had a good therapist in the past, but I've also had a bad therapist that like stresses me out. Like I'm more stressed out after the session than before yeah. the yeah. session. So a good therapist, I for sure think, yeah. uh, will help you see things that you just probably, you wouldn't arrive to that destination on your own. And your homegirls can't help you get there either. No. Because they be just as toxic and messed up as you and they trying exactly. to talk you off the ledge They're and they be a part therapists. of the problem. They're not therapists. Your pastor's not a therapist. <laughs> and you can do both, sis. You can go to church and the therapist. Yes, okay, you can do still, both. The pastor's not a therapist. Absolutely okay. not. And he and probably need a therapist himself as well. That's something in the black community. Pray it out. Go right. to church. Just I mean, you can pray still about pray it. about it. Of but course. then you're going to have to take some action. But you need a therapist. Yes. That's what they're here for. They're professionals. So a life coach is great, actually, because when I meet with my therapist, sometimes I don't even know what I'm going to talk to her about. But somehow she always she finds it. something. Yep. Yeah, she always finds something to talk to me about that like, Damn, she gets I, it out of me. I, on the way here, I didn't think this is where the conversation yes. was going to go, but here yes. we are. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about Paging Dr. You. So Paging Dr. You came out because um, being where I am now, looking back at what I had to go through, at the time, back then, I thought it was normal. You know, in so reference much, to what? In reference to being um, a black girl in the medical field. And looking good like you do. I know that was hard. <laughs> I know it was. I used to wear my heels and dress up to work. And it's like looking around and nobody looks like you. You know, and the comments and the stares and the things people um, used to say and do and make you do. Um, back then, you think well, that's just how the world is. It's normal. Deal with it. Right? And then years and years of working in that field and getting into social media and realizing that, wait a minute, that is not normal. They want you to think it is, but it's not. It's all these like microaggressions, you know. Um, and then starting to think, wait, why is it only two and a half percent of doctors are black women? Mm -hmm. It's not that we're not smart, we're smart. So what's the problem? You know, I think the system is meant to fail us. Yep. And it's meant to fail us very early on. It starts with the little ones. Mm -hmm. That's why we're hard, we're, we're where we are now. Um, and so I wanted to write a book that was like a blueprint for the younger ones, middle school, high school, even college, to tell them exactly what they need to do to position themselves for success. And it's little simple things that they may never have heard before, like start working on your credit early. Because yes. medical school is expensive. You're probably going to need a student loan. And you don't want that to stop you from accomplishing your goals mm -hmm. or your dream. Or don't do nothing crazy on social media. Because it will follow you yep. all the way. And these uh, colleges are looking at this yeah, stuff. They're looking the at everything. They're looking at it. Yes. And you don't want something to bite you in the butt yep. later on. Um, or, you know, take this class or do this volunteer or keep up with everything you're doing. It's the little things to position them for success. I love that. I need to get yeah. a copy for my niece. These young girls, they are up against so much. Yeah, I know. It is so it's hard. Sad. It's yeah. very sad. I mean, I literally, I have nieces that are 22 and 21. They literally grew up watching like Maury and like Flavor of Love, like the reality show, like that was what they were watching in yeah. like first and second grade. That's right. what they grew up. See, right. They don't know anything else. Right. And so they literally have like a reality mentality. I need to coin that. A reality mentality. mentality. <laughs> like they are living in this reality TV world, but in their real life, they're comparing their real life to like what celebrities do and what they have and living up to and this. And that's not real life. It's not real. But mm -hmm. adults don't even realize it's not yeah. real. So imagine kids with their childish mindset thinking that this is reality and this is what they have it's to so compete with. It's so hard for them with. now because they're going to grow up wanting to reach something yep. that's or, not or reachable. Or caring about likes so much. Yeah. Can you imagine <laughs> like where our self-esteem and self-worth would be if we were judged like 
publicly, like on a platform, like an Instagram in middle school or at elementary. That's just crazy to think That's about. So, so much depression. Yep. So that know? so needed. I'm definitely gonna have and to get low self esteem because of copies. that. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And that's why a lot of relationships also are not working because they're seeing things that are not real. It's and comparing not their real life. Yeah to a fake reality mm -hmm. so where can we get a copy of this book Amazon, how can the people Barnes find it Nobles. you have a website too i have a website so paging. look look in your camera let them know where it is and your social media so you can get the book paging dr you on amazon or um barnes and nobles the website is um paging dr um and my wait the website is not paging dr. Um, <laughs> it's okay it's okay it's okay <laughs> The website, we'll put the, link. Doctor, We're put the website is dravbtoday.com. We'll put the link down below. Right. We'll find the real link, <laughs> figure out what it is, and we'll put it down below. And then um, my IG handle is at dr.evab. So it's dr.evab. We'll check that out. We'll put mm -hmm. it all down below. Y'all, make sure y'all stay connected with Dr. Ava. She's giving all of the fabulous family um, vibes on Instagram. I appreciate it. I know y'all will, too. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this conversation. If you have a young lady in your life, make sure you grab a copy of the book. Sounds like it's a game changer. I'm definitely going to make sure I get not one, not two, but a few. Okay, I'm going to just throw them things out because it's so much... Um, wisdom I think that is not being passed on mm -hmm. and these young girls got to get it somehow mm -hmm. so yeah. check her out y'all thank you for tuning in make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out on the next episode and I will see you next time if you enjoyed that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming content and Take it a step further and go ahead and join our private community over on Patreon because it comes with some pretty bomb perks, including early and discounted access to our upcoming events, behind the scene exclusives with some of your favorite guests, the opportunity to call in on an upcoming show, the chance to vote on topics and guests for brand new shows, and I'm even giving you unlimited access to my vault of business classes where I'm teaching you everything from Airbnb to developing digital products and everything in between. And you can get access to our Patreon for as little as $5 a month, okay? Get in where you fit in, and I'll see you on the inside. Peace.